Hi there. Hello everyone who's joining me. Welcome. Uh, so today I'll be talking about functional and creative movement for yoga teachers. And this is really valuable, not just when you're teaching for fresh ideas and inspiration, but also for your own personal practice to stay inspired and to get curious about the movements that we make on and off of our mat in a lot of cases, because most of us know that good biomechanics do translate from our mat to our activities that we do away from it. So I want to start just by getting us all centered and grounded so that we're able to fully receive all the information that there is in this half hour session together. So please come to a nice, tall, comfortable seat. And even if you're on a couch or you're laying down, that's totally fine. Just stay where you are and close your eyes. Begin to connect with the sensations that are present in your body. The heaviness of your ankles, your shins and thighs. Feel your sit bones rooting into the earth as you lengthen your tailbone down. Connect to the gentle support in your lower belly. Let your heart stack over top your hips as your head settles over top your heart. And let go of any holding in your face. Widening the space between your brows as you relax your jaw. And turn that inward gaze to the frequency of your breath. Feeling the space in your belly, ribcage, and collarbones with every breath in. And the gentle softness of every breath out. Allowing yourself to be curious about the expansiveness that it creates for you. There might be one side that feels more open or one space more receptive without judging that experience as good or bad, just allowing yourself to be curious. And set your hands in front of your heart in Anjali Mudra. Rub your palms together briskly. Continue to breathe steadily in and out your nose. You take time to wake up some of the nerve endings in your palms. Then slow that down. Settling back in front of your heart. The vibration of Aum resonates with the threads that connect us all. So I invite you to join me in practicing a single Aum. Exhale as we empty our lungs. Inhale. Return back to your natural inhale and exhale. And release your hands down. 
and float your eyelids open. <laughs> so I hope you all feel centered and grounded and ready to learn. Hey, Andrea, really nice to see you here. I'm glad you could join. So when thinking about functional movement, it's important to understand the definition. What is functional movement? And that's being able to move the body with proper muscle and joint function for an effortless and pain-free range of motion. So if we think about that in our own body, what range of motion looks like, that's going to vary from person to person. Because essentially, when we were born, we all have a certain structure. And that's impacted by many things. Uh, genetics being a huge factor that our bone structure is the basic framework of that structure. And then everything else is built upon that. So if we think about ligaments, what connects bone to bone, or we think about uh, tendons, which connect muscle to bone, we are going to have different tendon length ratios. We are going to have slightly, like slight variances in joint structures. So if you think about something like the hip socket, which is a ball and socket joint, any slight variance in that hip structure, whether it's rotated uh, outwardly or more of an anterior orientation or the depth of that hip socket, that is going to impact how the femur sits into that acetabulum, that hip socket. And then there's other things on top of that that affect and impact movement in a functional way. So if you have certain ligaments that cross certain areas along that joint structure, that is going to impact movement significantly. And everyone will have variance in that. You in your life and perhaps with your students or maybe with your friends, you probably know some people who are naturally super flexible, like the Gumby people. <laughs> I know I'm definitely not one of those people <laughs> and maybe you can relate. I feel like through my yoga practice and through my life that I've had to work very hard to get any form of flexibility. Uh, but there is a trade-off with that because if you are someone who doesn't have the flexibility um, and lacks mobility in that area, you probably have a lot of stability, which is a huge advantage. Uh, I know the friends that I have or the students that I have that are more mobile, are generally more prone to dislocating their joints and hi, uh, are more prone to dislocating their joints and have issues related to instability. So there's a bit of a trade-off there and you might find yourself on one end of the spectrum or the other. And when I think about this kind of relationship between mobility, flexibility, and stability, I think of one of the sutras. It's the second sutra, Stira Sukham Asanam. Every posture should be steady, stable, and comfortable. And we all know that comfort is kind of a relative thing because we might not feel comfortable holding something like chair pose for 20 breaths. <laughs> not really my personal idea of a fun time, <laughs> good to build strength, but not necessarily what we would view as comfortable. Although, however, on the flip side of that, if you are practicing chair pose for 20 breaths, that your joints, your knees, your ankles, your hips, should feel easeful as you practice these and no sharpness or pain. We all know this in our personal practice that we feel strong sensations sometimes, but that those sensations aren't the type of intensity that would cause harm. So we're always in that realm of stira sukham asanam. Now, when we're considering how to create functional movement in our classes for our personal and professional development, we want to think about dynamic versus static movement. So when we think about joint movement, something that's dynamic you could think of would be wrist rotation. That's a dynamic movement. 
opening and closing the fingers. That's flexion and extension of the metacarpal joints. So dynamic movement. Whereas if I was to do static movement, what that could look like is flexion. Flexion of my wrist. Extension. Extension of my wrist. And holding it for a longer period of time. With fingers, extending fingers, and flexing them. So static versus dynamic. And so when we're thinking about creating a sequence, we have to consider what style we're doing. Is this more of a hatha-based practice or is this a vinyasa flow-based practice? Because that will influence whether you do more dynamic movements or static movements. For the most part, in a hatha practice, you would see more static movements. You might warm up with some dynamic movements, which is a wonderful way to warm up the body. And generally, muscularly, it will be better to start with dynamic movements because it won't feel as intense and there won't necessarily be the amount of depth to warm up to it. And with a vinyasa style of practice, you will probably see a lot more dynamic movement. So when should you do what? Ah, we just talked about that. See, I have my little notes here. I like leaving little cliff notes so I remember all these little good tidbits of information for you all. <laughs> ah, jumping ahead is great. <laughs> so in terms of uh, where do function and creativity meet? So with functional movement, we can consider joint movements. In terms of creativity, there are so many creative ways to combine movement. We have to consider what are safe movements for that joint. So knowing what type of joint it is and knowing what type of movement it does. And even if you don't know the name of the type of joint, like you don't know if, a hinge, if it's a hinge joint, if it's a pivot joint, if it's um, a gliding joint, it doesn't really matter if you know the exact definition anatomically. That doesn't matter. What truly matters is do you understand how that joint moves? So with a shoulder joint, we know that it's ball and socket joint, does circumduction, does flexion, extension, uh, abduction, adduction, does all of these different movements. So how can we combine those movements to not only be functional, but also to be creative and to spice up our practice. <laughs> so something simple as taking your hands onto your shoulders and doing shoulder rotation. That's an example of functional and creative movement. We don't have to do this just sitting down like I am. You could do this from a high lunge. You could do uh, shoulder movement in a warrior two. There's all sorts of places that you could put in functional and creative movement. And that just depends on what spaces are fixed and what are moving. Now, when it comes to this definition of what's fixed, what's moving, we kind of move into uh, kinetic chain exercises. And what that means is that there's a difference between uh, open chain movement and closed chain movement. So if I think about fixing my feet onto a surface and then doing exercises with that, that's an example of like a closed chain. Whereas an open chain would be something where my body part is not fixed. So if I'm doing arm movements, that is ex an example of strengthening my arms. However, my arms are not fixed to a position. Whereas if I was doing something like plank pose or something more strengthening push-ups, that would be an example of a closed chain of movement. Now, there are so many opportunities to do open chain movements when our feet are fixed. And if there is a closed chain movement, for example, like a plank pose, then we can look at doing more open chain, say, with our legs. It depends on what is supported and what is not supported. So when it comes to function and creativity, you have to consider what the intention is behind it. And for this thinking, it comes back to sequencing. So when I am sequencing something, 
For me, I like to sequence with a peak pose. And this gives me a lot of clarity around what I want to teach before that posture. Now, when I'm talking about peak pose, I mean the most complex pose that you choose to teach, meaning that it requires more mobility and it requires uh, a certain level of uh, flexibility, strength, and openness to achieve that posture in a successful way. For instance, you wouldn't choose to do Hanuman, Hanumanasana uh, without doing an ample amount of hip opening, hamstring opening. Um, yeah, I would say hip and hamstrings would be really big for Hanuman for full split. You would never do full split right at the beginning of a class. You would want to make sure that your students are warm. If you are practicing, you want to make sure that you are warm to ensure that the practice is safe. So when we are thinking about functional and creative movement for those, you might consider, if we use the example of Hanuman, if we use that example of full split, then we can think of hamstring openers that are dynamic and static. So something like Janya Shoshasana, one-legged forward fold, hamstring opening is involved. You can make that static in terms of a hold, or you could make it dynamic. So I'll show you what that looks like when we get a little bit more into the practice side of things. In the meantime, a couple more things to discuss in our lecture before we get going with a bit of a practice. <laughs> Ah, why this is important. So why is it important to integrate functional and creative movement? And the biggest thing is to add variety into your practice to avoid repetitive stress injuries. Now, there are some people who can do chaturanga, up dog, down dog, all day every day for the next 20 years and be fine. I know for myself varied movement has been really valuable in keeping my body healthy and strong. And you've probably seen this. <laughs> Hi Marcel, nice to see you. Um, so with in terms of varied movements, uh, we think of tennis stars, and you've probably heard that a lot of tennis stars deal with repetitive stress injuries, like shoulder injuries, um, in terms of tears and issues with ligaments in their shoulders, because they're constantly doing this, they're constantly doing it with the same arm. And we can see that sometimes in our yoga practice, that there are certain repetitive stress injuries that can happen by doing the same thing over and over and over again. So when we vary our movements and we practice healthy movements for our body, then we can keep our body healthy, strong, and supported. Coming back to that sutta, sukham asam, every posture should be steady, stable, and comfortable. And that's not just today, but for the long term, because ideally we want our practice to be with us for life and we want healthy movements for life, not just on our mat, but also off of our mat as well. And finally, really important aspect to consider with yourself and your students is injury. And when you are doing these dynamic movements, who is included in this and who is not included? And how can you make that practice an inclusive one? So for an example, there are certain transitions or certain dynamic movements that might not work for everybody, or you have to modify them in a specific way. So if we think about something like a squat, malasana, garland pose, and for sitting there in garland pose, we might think, oh, this doesn't work for some people's knees, ankles, and hips. Now, if you were to add some dynamic creative movement to that, and you were to go from full squat to a forward fold and to alternate like that, for some people that might work well 
and others not so much. So for some, especially if they've had like a knee replacement or hip replacement or they rolled their ankle, they might not be able to do the amount of flexion that that movement requires. So for them to do subtle movements, to only bring their hips halfway instead of all the way, that is going to work a lot better for them. And I think that as teachers, it is part of our responsibility to give our students a heads up and to let them know, hey, this isn't gonna work for everyone and that's okay. There are so many people, myself included, <laughs> that have injuries. I know here in Whistler, we have a lot of people with sports injuries. Uh, you see a lot of people with knee issues, some with hips, some with shoulder. So to be really mindful of what's happening in people's bodies so that you can speak directly to them. Okay. Do I have any questions from anyone before we get going into a little practice? All right. Well, there might be questions that come up and we'll do a little Q&A at the end so that if you do have anything burning coming up, then you can let me know. <laughs> so let's get into a little bit of this functional and creative movement. This practice that I designed, I've been doing a lot in my own practice and I've been using these blocks and this is really nice to do. Uh, what I like to do for supported bridge, was, which some of you might be familiar with, for those who really like height, those who really love to backbend, I know that a lot of teachers place the blocks like this on their sacrum at that flat bone at the base of their spine. And for myself, and for anyone who's ever had a sacroiliac injury, the SI joint, which connects the sacrum to the rest of the pelvis, to the ilia, um, it's not a fun time. <laughs> it's just not fun. And so in my own practice, I've been looking at ways to support that joint a little bit better. And I like to place the blocks sideways. And what that does is it supports the pelvis on both, on all sides, so that your ilia and your sacrum, that flat bone, they function together and there's no kind of separation of the two. Um, and there's a lot less chance of there being instability. So if you like height, stack your blocks. If you don't want height, hey, use one block. Just make sure you use it sideways. If you don't have blocks at home, use a pillow, a really great option. And come to lying down on your back. I hope that you all can see me and maybe not. So I'll move my camera for you. <laughs> Give me one sec. Hopefully that's a little bit better. You can see me lying down? I think so. All right. Now take hold of your props. Inhale to lift your hips and slide them underneath so it supports the entire back of your pelvis. Then let your shoulders sink into your mat and open across your chest. With your inhale, extend one leg high. Your exhale, bend your knee. Inhale as you straighten. Exhale as you bend. Continue with your breath. Now we think about the movement of our knee. Our knee is actually a what's known as a bicondylar joint. Sometimes it's considered a hinge joint but there is a mild amount of rotation in your knee and you might even be able to feel that as you extend and flex at your knee joint. Your inhale, keep your leg extended. Your exhale, point your toe. Inhale as you flex. Exhale as you point. And you might notice as I'm teaching this, I'm using really simplified language, which I encourage you to do as you teach. So right now we're pra practicing dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsi being when your toe comes towards your shins and 
planter flexion when you're pointing your toe. And start rotating your ankle in one direction. And go the other way. Your breath stays steady and smooth. And find a strong flex in your ankle, pressing your heel skywards. Cross your ankle just above your knee and then release your leg out wide. Keep anchoring down through both sides of your pelvis. Now you might notice that we started with some dynamic movement and now we're doing a little bit of static movement. And close your eyes. Feel your breath moving in and out of your body. Your exhale, lower your foot back down. Inhale, extend the other leg high. And come back to bending and straightening your knee. Use your breath to set the pace. Inhale as it straightens, exhaling as it bends. And although this might seem like a simple movement, you'll probably notice a lot happening here. A lot of thigh strengthening, some quadriceps. And even as you bend your knee, do this with control, and that helps to activate your hamstrings along the back of your leg. So you see how functional movement works to support the muscular contractions in our body as well. And keep your leg extended. Start pointing and flexing your foot. Inhale as it flexes, exhaling as it points. With this movement, you'll probably notice a lot of strength along the front compartment of your shin, tibialis anterior, or a few other muscles involved in dorsiflexion. And as you point, you'll probably notice your calf muscles turn on. And it's nice to have that balance as you do these dynamic movements. And start making circles with your ankle. Long inhales and exhales. Other way. And with your exhale, bend your knee. Keep the strong flex in your foot as you cross it and send your knee wide. Feel the sweetness in your breath. Exhale, release your foot down. Inhale, lift your hips and slide your props out from underneath. Lower all the way down onto your back. Gather your knees into your chest, give them a loving squeeze and take a slight rock from side to side.
Then tuck your chin in towards your chest and wrap your hands underneath your knees. Then rock up to seated. If it takes a few rocks, all good. <laughs> now we talked about Janyushasana, Janyushasana, one-legged forward fold with some dynamic movement. So let's give that a go. Extend both of your legs. Come into Dandasana staff pose. I know you can't quite see my legs, but that's all right. Keep your thighs strong and press out through your heels. Let your toes point skywards. And if you notice any tilting back in your pelvis, bend your knees. Allow yourself to sit nice and tall. Then bend your left leg and plant the sole of your foot on your inner thigh. With your inhale, reach both arms high. Exhale, fold forward. Inhale, reach both arms up. Exhale, plant left palm down behind you. Inhale, lift your hips, reach your arm back. Exhale, lower down. Inhale, both arms skywards. Exhale, fold. Inhale, lift. Exhale, plant left palm. Inhale, hips rise. Exhale, lower down. Keep going with your breath. Now you'll notice that this dynamic movement has a lot of stuff happening in your joints, which is great. It's wonderful to get all sorts of different types of movement happening in your body. And we are opening up our hamstrings while we're doing it. We're also creating some back bending, so moving the joints in our spine. Your inhale, reach both arms up. Exhale, release your arms down. Let's switch legs. Inhale, both arms high. Exhale, fold. Inhale, lift up. Exhale, plant palm. Inhale, hips up. Exhale, lower down. Keep going with your breath. Your exhale, lower back down, extend both legs, inhale, reach both arms up, exhale, hands through heart center, inhale, circle high, exhale, hands at heart, close your eyes, press your thumbs against your chest bone, feel the rise and fall of your breath anchoring you back into the present. And release your hands down and open your eyes. Bend your knees, rest them flat on your mat. And I hope your Yoga Flow alumni that you all know how important it is to practice Shavasana. And this has a very important, a very important presence in terms of functional and creative movement. Because when we practice Shavasana, that's essentially a nervous system reset that our body is learning all sorts of new neurological connections. And when it comes to building strength and muscle memory, for us to fully relax and integrate will just help make those connections a little bit stronger. So ease to the top of your mat, and if there's any props or socks or a sweater that you need to support you, this is the time to grab those things. Inhale, reach your arms forward. Exhale, slowly lower down. Then when you arrive on your back, separate your feet wide, maybe even more than that distance apart. Don't feel afraid to take up space. 
Let your arms release open to your sides or stack on your belly, whatever resonates with you right now. And begin to feel the entire weight of your body sinking and surrendering into the earth. Your entire body begins to feel heavy. And as you reflect on this heaviness throughout your body, begin to shift to where you feel spaciousness. Perhaps it's that gentle space that you feel with each passing breath. But right now, there's no technique that's needed. Let go of the Ujjayi. Only your natural rhythm is present. Begin to take more generous breaths into your belly and the area that surrounds your heart. Move your fingers and toes, your wrists and your ankles. And tilt your head side to side. Guide your knees into your chest. And rest to one side. Your inhale, lift up to seated. Mm -hmm. 
Well, everyone, that concludes our practice portion. Namaste to you all. <laughs> I was wondering if any of you had any questions about func functional or creative movement and how to integrate them into your practice and into your sequences for teaching. Thank you, Vicki. And you know, the questions might not come right away. You might take some of this into consideration when you're building your sequences and you might end up having questions later. So if you do have anything that comes up that you're curious when you're designing your own personal practice or when you're creating something for your students, feel free to drop a comment. Uh, we'd love to keep this conversation going. So take care, everyone. Wonderful to have you here. Hope you have a beautiful rest of your day.